Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anthony Crowell, Dean and President here at New York Law School, and I'm very excited to welcome you to our latest Law and Leadership Forum with two exceptional candidates for the next mayor of New York City. This event, like others in our series, is really about our students and recent graduates. It's about the questions that are on their minds. As the next generation of leaders, they are eager to learn more about the candidates' ideas, their leadership, philosophy, and strategies. And most importantly, who holds the most promise for their future. Today, we are joined by one of our most recent graduates and three student leaders. Uh, finally, one quick programming announcement. After our session ends with Sean Donovan at 1230, we'll immediately move to our second session with Art Chang, so don't go anywhere. And that session will end at 1 p.m. So with that, I wanna welcome Sean Donovan. Sean's a lifelong New Yorker who spent much of his career as a leader in urban policy and federal and city government. He served in the Obama administration cabinet as secretary of housing and urban development and as director of the US Office of Management and Budget. Before joining the Obama administration, he served as the commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development in the Bloomberg administration where we were fellow colleagues and he is someone whom I greatly respect and appreciated working with. We're privileged to have him join us today. Welcome, Sean. Anthony, Dean, I should say, it is great to see you. Thanks so much for having me on. And, and it's great to see all the students and recent grads as well. Excited for the conversation. Great, and we are very appreciative of you being here. So we're gonna start with Katie. Katie, um, Katie's a, our recent graduate. Um, take it away. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for uh, being with us today, Sean. It's it's a pleasure to meet you, and I look forward to our discussion. Um, a brief background about me. I graduated from New York Law School last May. I was an evening student, and I worked for the city full time um, prior to getting my law degree. I currently live in Vinegar Hill, Brooklyn, where I've been for the last six years, um, and I grew up on Long Island, but I like to say I'm also a lifelong <laughs> New Yorker. Um, so. My question is, my first question to you is something that's really important to me. Hurricane Sandy was an event that really got my interest in emergency management um, way back when I was in college. I was a student downtown at Pace University during that time. And as I'm sure you know, that every emergency, we have a response period and a recovery period. And sometimes how we recover from an emergency can be just as important as how we respond to an emergency. I know that you had spent a lot of time leading the Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force, and so you know firsthand how important recovery is. Since it'll be almost 10 years since Hurricane Sandy next year, which is hard to imagine, um, can you tell us some of the most important lessons that you learned during your time um, leading that initiative and how you'll bring them uh, should you become our next mayor? Absolutely, Katie. And, and first, thank you for your service. Uh, public service is always important, but at this moment, it has never been more important given the challenges that we're facing. So uh, look, what I would say first of all is that the lesson I learned, not just in Sandy, but in responding to the mortgage crisis, uh, working with Anthony in the wake of 9-11, the work we did on Ebola and Zika when they were potential uh, pandemics is really two things. First, those who are most vulnerable before a crisis hits are always hurt the worst by it. So this is true both in immediate response but also recovery that you have to focus on the folks you know that are gonna be the hardest to reach with help, that are gonna have the toughest time uh, weathering the storm and, and recovering. And just think about what we've seen with uh, this crisis in COVID. The folks who aren't getting vaccines, the immigrant and frontline worker communities that had by far the highest rates of COVID infection, but also suffered the worst because the pre-existing uh, health conditions that existed in neighborhoods that were much more likely to be overrun with COVID, all of these frankly, outraged me, but they didn't surprise me because this is what happens in crisis is. And so in your response and in your recovery, you have to focus on those that are most, most vulnerable. And so that's one. Second I, big lesson I would say, and this is something President Obama used to say to us regularly in, in moments of crisis is 
we cannot let a crisis go to waste. And, and I think what this means for me, just being very personal, you know, I, I've looked in the eyes of so many families who have lost everything, whether it was their home to foreclosure, uh, their home to Sandy, their entire community, to devastating uh, other storms. Katrina was an example that I worked really closely with Mayor Mitch Landrieu and others on. Uh, and, and here's the thing. When you look in the eyes of a family who's been through something like this, what you see is intense pain and loss, but you also see an understanding that our world is fragile, right? I mean, think about everything we've lost in our personal lives, in our professional lives this past year. You realize that the world can change. And there's, I think, a demand, uh, a, a, an anger and pain from a crisis like this, but also an understanding that the world can change for the worse, but also for the better. And that when you're rebuilding, it can't just be back to the status quo that we had. It has to be a different, a, a new normal after the storm. And so with Sandy, just to give you one specific example, um, a lot of people thought I was crazy. I took a billion dollars out of the Sandy Relief Fund, out of the 60 billion. I organized a worldwide design competition with the best scientists and architects and landscape architects and urban planners. And we went to communities and said, let's imagine what your community could look like that would be different. Uh, not just for the next Sandy, not just on the one day every hundred years that that storm comes, but the other 99 years and 364 days that you're in your community. And so we started building uh, new parks and new investments in economic development and other things that were important for climate change, but also would make much more fundamental changes in communities that would make them better on the days when we didn't have extreme, extreme weather. And it's those kind of initiatives. I like to say, you know, most people think of public service as the art of the possible. I like to think of it as the art of the nearly impossible. Those are the things that you that can happen during crisis if you really lead with this idea that we cannot let a crisis go to waste. Terrific. Thanks. Our next question is from Rana. Rana. Thank you, Dean. Uh, Mr. Donovan, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you. Um, my name is Rana. I'm an immigrant and also a Manhattan resident. I'm a rising 2L day division here at New York Law School uh, with the interest in the interface between technology, law, and government. Um, my question to you now is during the pandemic, numerous New Yorkers were at high risk of losing their homes or commercial property. There was the eviction and foreclosure of federal and state moratoriums that were put in place to provide a temporary relief. Once they expire, there will be like a slew of cases crowding our court's dockets. What, was, what would be your approach in managing the balance between keeping as many people as possible in their homes and provide financial stabilities for landlords at the same time? Well, Rana, first of all, um, as a son of an immigrant who grew up in Manhattan, I'm uh, excited to be here with you. And uh, I'm so glad you asked this question because just to be very blunt, we're on the, on the verge of the worst eviction crisis this city has ever seen right now, with still about a half a million New Yorkers out of work, so many who've seen reduced hours. Uh, this is a catastrophe if we don't get this right. And you know, I have a little experience in this work. Uh, we design programs in the wake of the housing, the mortgage crisis in the Great Recession that kept millions of families in their homes and, and did that effectively. And so there are a couple different pieces we have to make sure of. First, we have to protect people from being evicted in the first place. And part of that is getting them the money they need to pay back rent. Um, luckily, there is uh, billions of dollars, tens of billions actually, that's been pay passed by Congress in the last two COVID relief packages. Um, I actually testified about this. I worked with leaders in Congress and in the administration to try to get this money in there, to, to have it designed in the right way. And that's the huge opportunity we have if we can put it to work effectively. The problem is that so often what we see is the money doesn't get quickly enough to the folks who need it most. And so what's key is not just having the money, but building the partnerships with local organizations who really know which families are at risk. 
When, when we designed the homeless prevention and rapid rehousing program in the wake of the Great Recession, we made sure that it could be used very flexibly by local nonprofit organizations. Say you have uh, a Catholic charities or other religious uh, uh, nonprofits that are working closely with families. Say you have uh, supportive housing providers or nonprofits that manage affordable housing. They're in contact every day with those families and they're the front lines. They're the early warning system. They know that families are on the risk uh, of eviction. The same is true for our teachers and our schools often. And so really making sure that that money is available in communities at nonprofits in, and, and flexible. So there's not a huge amount of red tape because often the difference between a family staying in their home and ending up in a shelter or on the streets is one month's rent or, or a utility bill, or if they're moving uh, a security deposit, you know, so it can often be very small amounts of money, but delivered quickly and effectively is, is really important. The other thing I will say, and I won't just say this because uh, I'm talking to the New York Law School, but having housing counseling and legal services available to every family is incredibly important. When, when the mortgage crisis started and I was working with Anthony um, in the Bloomberg administration, I, I went to a range of community leaders, nonprofits, and we started something called the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, which invested in housing counseling, legal services, financial solutions. And it was incredibly effective at keeping people in their homes. And, and those legal services are, are indispensable um, in, in those moments of crisis. And so what I would do is take what has been a commitment from this mayor, but not an actual uh, resolution, like an actual delivery of solutions, I would make legal services available citywide rather than the pilot we have now to ensure that every family can be protected in their home and, and not be evicted. Thanks. Uh, next, we're going to ask Jacob to uh, pose his question to you. Jacob. Thank you, Dean. Hi, Mr. Donovan. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Jacob. I'm a 1L student and I will be living in the financial district area when we're back in person for law school. And I'm interested in pursuing a career in corporate law. My first question is um, in regards to commercial tenants, um, when New York City passed many regulations during the pandemic, many commercial tenants were forced to shutter their doors and weren't able to um, conduct their business as usual. How do you plan on ad addressing these tenants in New York City and how do you plan to regain their trust and bring them back, especially in light of the fact that many courts are not letting uh, commercial tenants use COVID-19 pandemic as a reason for not paying rent or not being able to break their leases. Yeah, so Jacob, this is so important. Um, you know, we talked about the catastrophe we have on the housing side. Uh, the same is true uh, on the commercial side where we see vacant storefronts ev everywhere. We see uh, small businesses, restaurants and others that are, are frankly, if they've made it through, still struggling to survive to get to the other side of the health pandemic. And so what I would say is there's a similar uh, discussion we should be having about commercial rent relief that is available. Luckily, again, we do have real movement in Congress the last few months with President Biden in office. And we have a real opportunity, um, not just to get PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, which is not effectively gotten to small businesses. Often it, it doesn't work effectively for uh, businesses that uh, haven't been able to use it because of a, a whole lot of red tape and restrictions on employees and others. And so we need to get other kinds of assistance quickly to those businesses to make sure they're coming back. But that's not gonna help if we can't get people back onto our streets customers uh, back out. And, and so what I would say is really two things on that. One is we need a strategy to ensure that we're making the city truly safe. My Safest Cities commitment would ensure that we have the testing, the tracking, the technology. Every time you get on the subway, every time you drop your kid off at school or go to the office, out to a restaurant or a show, you know that the city is safe because we have effectively put in place all the screening and testing um, and are getting vaccines to those who, who need it most. So that's one. But second, we got to bring the city alive again. And, you know, my proposal is that we fill our vacant storefronts with arts and culture, pop up restaurants, fill our public places 
Um, you know, I'll never forget as a kid growing up in the city, the I Love New York campaign and what that meant to bring us together, to let New Yorkers know, uh, to let everyone who's been locked in their Zoom box this past year, that New York is coming alive again. I would have a new, an, a new I Love New York campaign, working with NYC and company to let everyone know that we were coming back and really effectively use the, again, like I said earlier, cannot let a crisis go to waste, use those vacant storefronts, use the opportunity this moment, not just to get those uh, filled and get people back out on the streets so that customers are really going um, to our, our local uh, businesses again, but also to make sure that as we're doing that, we're co creating things like community trusts for some of this space and others that could lock in low priced um, retail space for ensuring that we have new retail that's coming up longer term as well, because we should recognize this wasn't just a problem created by COVID. Online retailing and other things were fundamentally changing the way we shop, where we shop before. And we were already had an oncoming crisis, which has just been accelerated. And so if we can use this moment to really create long-term affordable space that's available, if we can part pair that with entrepreneurship uh, financing, like my entrepreneurship financing fund that I would make available to ensure that we're getting new businesses started again. Great, very thoughtful answer, thank you. Uh, next, I wanna ask Ellie to uh, pose her question, Ellie. Hi, Mr. Donovan, my name is Ellie. I'm a rising 2L and a resident of Queens and I'm interested primarily in family law. My first question to you is this, based on your past experience as a member of President Obama's cabinet and a housing commissioner in the Bloomberg administration, what would be the immediate areas of focus in your first 90 days in order to rapidly push forward the city's post pandemic recovery? A small question, huh? <laughs> so, First, what I would say is it goes back to the pandemic itself. There is no recovery without solving the, the health pandemic. And my hope is that by January next year, that we are very far along in helping this city overcome. And certainly over the last month, we've seen cases come down, uh, even just in the last few weeks, dramatically. and. I'm hopeful that we will be able to, to move past the pandemic, but obviously we have to, as I said, my safest cities commitment would ensure that everyone knows, New Yorkers know, uh, potential tourists know that the city is safe and, and folks can come back. And so that's, that's first, but the economic discussion we've just had is absolutely critical to bringing back those small businesses. And, and here's an idea that I would put in place at, at a larger scale. Last, uh, last year, as the pandemic was coming on, I knew that our restaurants were gonna have a hard time staying open, but also that we had so many people who were facing food insecurity. And so I went out, I raised over a million dollars, uh, connected with Jose Andres of World Central Kitchen and uh, Rethink Food, another remarkable nonprofit. And we got restaurants cooking in the hardest hit neighborhoods and they were cooking hot, fresh emergency meals that we were able to deliver directly to people's doors. We developed an app that people could order directly instead of having to go wait in line at, um, at soup kitchens and potentially get COVID. And most importantly, we designed this so that FEMA dollars, federal uh, dollars could pay for it so that we could inject hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars into the economy. Uh, to get it going. And so these are the kinds of lessons we have to apply uh, on day one in the first 90 days and, and beyond is how do we effectively really tap into all the resources that we can bring to New York? Because think about this, this is really a new deal moment that we are living through. I would say a new new deal moment with trillions of dollars of federal aid that's available. If we have the right leadership at City Hall, we could effectively make this a moment where the city not just recovers, but is able to uh, be a, a much stronger and fairer place uh, at, after the recovery. And, and here's the thing, the history shows us that Fiorella LaGuardia was the most transformational mayor in the history of the city. And, and in great part, that was because it was during the original New Deal. And he partnered with FDR, who was in the White House, a fellow New Yorker, had a deep relationship, 
and was able to make sure that New York City really benefited in fundamental ways uh, from that original New Deal moment. So I would suggest that at this new New Deal moment, from those first 90 days, we need a mayor in City Hall who can take advantage of this new New Deal moment. Terrific. Thank you. Ellie, you've had another question. I want to go back to you uh, with that. I think that's a good place to start with round two. So my second question, equity is a central theme running through your campaign proposals, which have included the appointment of a chief equity officer, the creation of 15 minute neighborhoods, and the provision of equity bonds to the children of New York. What is your view on the difference between equity and equality, and how will these concepts shape your governing focus? Well, Ellie, I'm so glad you asked this. Um, and, and I just want to say uh, this is something that really goes to the heart of what I meant before when I said we can't just be focused on building back the city that we had. Uh, we have to build a fairer city. Uh, I like to say we, we need to not just repair and rebuild our city, but reimagine it as a city that works for everyone. And equity is at the center of that. And, and what I would say about the difference between equity and equality is that equality often means that we're providing the same thing to everyone, that there's a, a sameness about it. And if you think about the COVID vaccine problems that we had in this city, it really goes to this difference, right? That everyone could equally get onto that website. Um, there was a single process that was equal for everyone, but it went, what it led to was a huge inequity in who actually got the vaccines. Because for obvious reasons, access to technology, uh, so many New Yorkers, particularly black and brown New Yorkers, couldn't spare two hours to get on the phone and wait or, or call multiple different places to try to get vaccines. So a, a, a response that would have been more focused on equity rather than equality would have set aside a large share of the vaccines for those that were going to be hardest to reach. We would have decided early on to create mobile vaccination sites that would have gone out to communities, set up in community rooms at public housing, in libraries, in other public places, and really made sure that we were getting to equity, not just being able to say, well, there's equality in who can sign up. And so that's the fundamental difference for me. And I, I do wanna take a moment really to focus on one of the ideas that you mentioned, because I think it's so important. It's, 15 minute neighborhoods. And you might ask, what is a 15 minute neighborhood? Well, here's the thing. Right now, you can predict the life chances, even the life expectancy of a child in this city by the zip code they grow up in. And that is fundamentally wrong. We have to change that. And the way to change it is 15 minute neighborhoods. And what it means is that I would reorient the way we plan our city to make sure that we're focusing on every single New Yorker having within 15 minutes of their front door, everything they need for a life of opportunity. So to be specific, a great school for their kids, a job that sustains their family or transportation that gets them there quickly in real time, uh, but also the healthcare that they need in their community. We would have had a very different outcome from COVID if we'd had the testing, the vaccines available at healthcare facilities in every neighborhood. But we also would have had a very different outcome if we'd had fresh food in every community within 15 minutes of their front door, a park to play in. It's these underlying disparities in health that lead to the disproportionate death rates that we've seen and 15 minute neighborhoods would be focused on those as well. Great, thanks so much. Uh, Katie, I'm gonna go back to you. You have uh, another question. Yes, thank you, Dean Crowell. So my second question for you is about um, how you plan to manage um, rebuilding and responding to agencies within city government. And so many agencies, as we've seen in the last year, have faced significant budget cuts and may have some competing interests um, that you'll have to address. So I'd like to know what is your plan um, for handling that as we have a lot of work to do and um, what are some of your ideas in that? Uh, so important, Katie. And uh, look, 
just to be honest, I think this has been one of the real challenges these last eight years is that we went from an administration where really focusing on making the wheels of government turn more effectively, more efficiently, more smoothly uh, was a central focus. And I think we've moved to a period where we put politics and ideology ahead of people. Uh, you know, Fiorella LaGuardia used to say there's no Republican or Democratic way to take out the trash. And I think that's fundamentally true. And we need a mayor in City Hall who is focused on not just ideology and politics, but, but people and making the city work for everyone. And so here are a few thoughts uh, about that. First of all, there's a fundamental challenge when you can't get government agencies to work effectively together. And the, the silos in government are a huge challenge to solving really tough, gnarly problems like, like homelessness, like the crisis we've had uh, in our streets uh, and the vacant storefronts that we talked about earlier. And, and let me just talk about homelessness for a moment because it's something that I'm so passionate about. I, I started volunteering in a homeless shelter in college. I went to work for the National Coalition for the Homeless uh, when I finished and have been working on housing and homelessness my whole career. It's a solvable problem but it's only solvable when you realize that you're not gonna solve homelessness with just homeless programs, because it isn't just an issue of shelter, right? It's an issue of mental health, uh, of substance abuse, of, of criminal justice involvement. And the only way you effectively solve it is by bringing together every single agency that touches it and coordinating and driving them toward a single clear goal rather than all of them pursuing different, uh, different directions, which is what we've seen and, and why we have literally more homeless people in New York than we've had since the depression. The number of individuals on our streets and in shelter has doubled under Mayor de Blasio over the last eight years. And so here's what I did when I was HUD secretary. I brought together uh, an interagency coalition uh, for homelessness. We had every single cabinet secretary at the table and we built a system where anytime someone who's really at risk of street homelessness, whether it be somebody leaving Rikers or somebody leaving the mental health wing of one of our public hospitals, we connect with them immediately and we direct them. We have, we have a plan that gets them into supportive housing quickly. That's not what's happening right now. They're falling through the cracks, end up on our streets. And I, I was in the Bronx the other day talking to a a gentleman, 18 months, he's been in quote unquote emergency shelter, hasn't had one conversation about moving to permanent housing. And so here's the crazy thing about it. It's not simple. You it takes real leadership to make these interagency groups work well, to build the data systems to really track and create accountability around this. We built something called HUDSTAT when I was HUD secretary that, that tracked all this. But the other thing is, if you get it right, you not only save lives by ending homelessness, you save money as well. This is the crazy thing about a lot of these solutions is that by putting a Band-Aid on it, by mismanaging it, you're not only costing lives, you're costing money. And, and why is that? Because when you live on the streets, where do you get your health care? In the emergency room. You cycle in and out of Rikers or the mental health wings of our public hospitals. We spend over $400,000 per person per year at Rikers and get terrible results. And so often if you can really make the hard work of government coordination and, and really effectively managing the data, tracking, making government work better, you can not only save lives, you can save money. And so that's key. And it also takes technology. Uh, and just one more example I would use, my CleanStat plan borrows from other cities who are really innovating in this area. Uh, many of them funded by uh, the Bloomberg Foundation that uh, has, has been a real driver of innovation in government. If you look at that, what we would do, track every single street in the city on a regular basis, inspect it, have the scores available publicly, and most importantly, put the power of government into people's hands. Allow people to take a picture on their phone of an overflowing trash can, send it into 311, get an immediate response, know that your government is actually responding to you because our best uh, early warning signs, our best canaries in the coal mine are our people. And we're not using them effectively using technology of the 21st century to make government work better. Great. 
Powerful. Sean Donovan, thank you so much for joining us here at New York Law School. We appreciate your perspective and your time, and we wish you much good luck in your pursuit of the Office of Mayor. Thanks so much. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you all. It's wonderful to be with you. Big elbow bump to everyone. Absolutely. Thanks again. Take care. All right. In just, in a, just moment, a moment, we will hear from our Chang. And we're just getting situated. I All right, and Professor Pastor will be joining us in one second. And just doing a sound check. There you go. All right, all right. Getting a little feedback here. All right, so uh, we are very pleased to be welcomed, uh, to, to welcome Art Chang today and uh, Art has been on our forum several times, both in a uh, forum on uh, education as well as parks. And today we'll be talking about technology. He's been a leader in the civic business and tech communities for decades. Most recently, he was a managing partner for JP Morgan Chase and he founded and led Tipping Point Partners, which incubated and founded a wide range of startup companies in New York City. He also has a long history in public service in the New York City Law Department and the Empire State Development Corporation. He served on the city's campaign finance board, including as chair of the CFB's Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. And he was also an appointee to the board of the Brooklyn Public Library, where we served together. Uh, to help facilitate today's conversation between Art and our students, uh, and considering the focus on uh, civic technology that Art has had for much of his career, we have asked New York Law School adjunct professor and senior fellow Michael Pastor to lead the discussion. Professor Pastor has a long career in government himself, most recently serving as deputy commissioner for legal affairs in the city's Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications and as general counsel for the NYC Cyber Command. He also served as a senior attorney in the city law department and as the city's first deputy criminal justice coordinator. Art, as you know, this is a uh, two-part program today, and our alum uh, and our students today will be focused mainly on your vision on technology, but also other issues of importance to them. Uh, so Professor Pastor may also ask a couple of questions of his own as well, if time permits. Professor Pastor. Thanks very much, uh, Dean. Thank you for, for having me and Art. Welcome to, to, the, to the law school. We're so glad to have you uh, here today. Um, as the Dean said, you know, I have lots of things I'd love to ask you about and to discuss, um, but we have this panel of, of you know, an alumnus and students, and I really want to just turn it over to them as a starting point. If, if I get lucky enough at the end to ask some of my questions, I certainly will do that. Um, but as I said, welcome. So for our first question, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Rana. Rana, can you start us off? Uh, thank you, Professor Pastor. Uh, Mr. Chang, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, my name is Rana. I am a Manhattan resident. My background is in engineering, and I'm also an immigrant tech entrepreneur. Currently a rising 2L day division student here at New York Law School. Uh, my interests are in the interface between technology, law, and government. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you is, uh, from personal experience, I found that rules and regulations are not adequately always keeping pace with technological advancements in areas such as social media, artificial intelligence, impact of blockchain technology, and more. Uh, this can create some uncertainty and drive some responsible innovators away. Um, as a serial entrepreneur yourself, how do you plan on encouraging more entrepreneurs, especially in the tech industry, to see New York as a welcoming city for their innovation? Well, thank you for that question. Um, I mean, New York City, to me, has always been a welcoming place for innovation. You know, back in the early 2000s, um, when people were telling tech startups that they should move to San Francisco or to Silicon Valley, I persuaded a San Francisco company to move to New York City. And since then, what I found is that 
tech entrepreneurs who have grown up in the Silicon Valley ecosystem who come here are surprised and delighted at how different our tech community is because it is unique. It's extremely welcoming, it's very open. The access to the major corporations in town are really, is really, is really significant. Um, but there's a kindness. And there's also this creativity that comes from the intersection with the arts and culture um, of New York City that really makes it a great place. But there is so much more that we can do. Um, in the 2010s, uh, people were talking about how there's a shortage of software engineers um, and talent for the startups in the city. And, um, you know, we, you know, in response, um, I led a program to create a technology apprenticeship program at CUNY to show that the CUNY, that the over 10,000 computer science majors and the additional 20,000 computer related and tech related majors could actually transition successfully into the tech community in New York City. Um, that was a very valid, great effort. And we actually created a, a huge program from that, but there's so much more that can be done. Um, one of the things that affects all businesses in New York City is actually streamlining all the processes for becoming a business. And so I'm proposing a one-stop shop, a kind of an incubator for startup companies where they can come and have all of their questions regarding the regulations, you know, really re resolved in one shot. Um, and one of those things is actually how do, how do startups in the city actually have opportunities to engage with the city for procurement? So when you talk about rules and regulations and the law, you know, this, the procurement system right now is too much of a one size fits all really designed for the largest companies. And so if you want to think about bringing technology innovation into the city government, we really have to think about reforming the procurement system, including and especially maybe even all the legal issues around the licensing and structuring of those contracts so that we can, we can bring in that innovation but also protect the city and its interests. And I confronted that, you know, you know, in, in a very, very tough way when um, in NYC Votes, which I co-created, and uh, we had a team on the private sector side who actually created all that technology. And then when it came time to gift it to the city, the city wanted us to sign a, a software licensing agreement that gave us unlimited responsibility for ENO errors and emissions but also unlimited response liability for IP infringement. And so we couldn't do this as volunteers and not unpaid at that. And so we ended up using open source as a bridge to enable the city to get access to it, but it's too cumbersome and it really slows progress. All right, great. Thank you, uh, Rana, for, for that question. And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jacob. Jacob, you're up. Thank you, Professor. Mr. Chang, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. My name is Jacob. I'm currently a 1L student, and I'm planning on living in the financial district area once we're back in law school, and I plan on pursuing a career in corporate law. My first question to you is, um, if there is such a uh, great push to improve access to uh, things such as affordable housing and other governmental services through technological advancement, how do you plan to balance this increased use in technology while protecting the privacy and data of users from unfair access by interagencies and other agencies of the government? Well, you know, you, you bring up the question of affordable housing. Um, we don't have an affordable housing system right now. We have 300,000, over 300,000 cases pending in housing, housing court right now. And if all of those result in eviction, that's like the population of Boston being evicted in our city. We don't have universal broadband. Um, you know, in 1994, I helped put Queens West in the ground. It was the first planned community with universal broadband. I mean, there's a T1 running to every single apartment in the first two buildings. And you wonder why didn't we do universal brown band between now and, and then? And so there's a lot that has to be done and could be done. Um, but you talk about, you know, some, a very important issue. You know, we don't actually think about this too much in the city because we're so busy doing other things. But I've proposed in my plan, a digital bill of rights to think exactly about those issues. Like, the city, in order to get really fully into the 21st century, needs to present its, its residents with a set of guidelines that would be baked into the city charter that could lay out the city's responsibilities to its residents regarding access to, um, access to broadband, 
the access to convenient and usable tools via the web to get access to government services and information, but also an understanding about the limitations of what government technology can do to surveil and, and get access to private data and for residents to really understand you know, how the city is going to use its data. And then we don't know anything in, you know, you know, about how the cities use its responsibility to things like cyber terrorism and cybersecurity and its obligation to protect the vast assets of the most, one of the most important cities in the world right, from these kinds of risks. And so we must make those explicit and put them out there, you know, while we also think about how we protect that data for our citizens. Okay, great. Thank you, Jacob. I have, I have five follow-ups per question here, but I'm going to try to hold mine uh, for, for the end out of respect to, for, for the students and the alum. Uh, and so right now, uh, let's go next to uh, Katie. Katie, uh, you're up. Hello, Art, thank you so much for coming and, and being with us today. My name is Katie. I am a recent alumna from New York Law School. I graduated. Congratulations. Thank you. I can't believe it's been a year. And I currently uh, work in private practice, but while I was in law school and a few years prior, I worked um, for the city at the emergency management department and got my law degree in the evening. And so um, I'm very invested in all things city government. So one question that I have for you while we're on the topic of technology is the use of um, accessible technology. And as we may see ourselves transitioning to a more remote workforce, many people, um, some people with access and functional needs, visual disabilities, sensory disabilities, um, struggle in keeping up with the remote um, workforce. And some have, ex including colleagues of my own, have expressed some challenges that they have with the remote work setup. So if you're elected mayor, how will you coordinate and help assist the city workforce in making sure that remote work is accessible for all and using technology to um, make sure that um, workers, regardless of any access or functional needs, are able to adequately and um, fully participate in their workforce? You know, it's a great question. And I'm just going to say right off the bat that this is a problem that most of the major corporations in the world have solved and most of the leading technology companies have solved and it is just part of what they do and how they do it and so you have to ask the question well why doesn't government act that way why is there such a gulf between our expectations from private companies versus our expectations from government and i would actually throw out that i think this gulf if we don't narrow it actually risks undermining our confidence in democracy because government is the instantiation of that democracy. And if we allow that gulf to continue to widen the way it has been, it's not going to work. And I firmly believe that, you know, as we know from, you know, consumer tech, that when you start from the bottom up, it actually is much better for everybody. And what I mean by that is we have so many people, so many communities in this city who have challenges accessing information. We have language challenges, we have internet challenges, and then we have you know, the, the disability challenges. So the city's obligation must be, and this would also be in that Bill of Rights, to provide digital communications to its residents in the language, in the channel, and on devices that meet their needs so they can exercise their rights as residents of our city. And this has to start with the workforce inside city government. You know, if we don't do this for our workforce, we're not gonna be able to do it for our people. And with the workforce of over 300,000 people, that is actually almost a consumer orientation. So we need to think about it moving to more of a customer centric, user centric, customer service orientation to all the people in the city. And today that means we have to improve our technology. Okay, great, uh, Katie, thank you for that question. And uh, next up we have Ellie, Ellie, go ahead. 
Thank you. And hi, Mr. Chang. My name is Ellie. I'm a resident 2L. Um, I am a resident of Queens with an interest primarily in family law. I'm also a millennial. And this is why my next question um, is this, which is, you've spoken about the unique technological, economic, social, and environmental factors that have impeded the city's millennial and Gen Z populations from having the same opportunities as prior generations. If elected, how would you expand opportunities for these New Yorkers with a particular emphasis on using technology? Millennials, you know, I have to just tell you a funny story. So in my, when I was at Tipping Point Partners, um, my, my employee base was largely millennials. And one of the greatest compliments I got was they called me the oldest millennial. I'm actually a baby boomer, but that to me was a great compliment. Um, I mean, millennials and Gen Z are over 50% of the population of the country, right? And of the city. And, you know, you're, you're, you, you may not remember a time before the internet. And if you're a Gen Z or you may not remember a time before the iPhone. So your expectations of the world are very different. But the other thing is that going, having gone through education as it's become increasingly expensive, right? Your generation is being saddled with unprecedented amount of student debt at a time when also the affordability of our city has also met, grown. And so what do we do about that, right? Technology is a piece of it. So we need to actually deliver the services, you know, to Katie's prior question in, in a way that addresses everybody. Um, but there are fundamental needs that millennials have that really are unique. And if we're going to actually take this generation, which for the first time, by the way, I also want to say this other thing that, that you know, millennials for the first time in American history have lower expectations of progress personally than any other generation in American history in terms of opportunity, prospects to do better than their parents. And so we need to remedy this. So there are a number of things that I'm proposing. Um, and by the, I also just released by this week a, a, a policy on millennials on my website at chang.nyc. I hope you look at it. But there are a couple of things. I mean, on, on, on student debt, you know, there is, I think, a significant opportunity to create a consolidation and refinancing vehicle for employees of city government to consolidate and lower the, the costs of student debt. You know, while, while we're hoping that Biden is able to waive a lot of this or, or forgive a lot of this, we can't assume that that's going to happen. And so there are things that we can do to leverage financial markets and the, and the financial industry in New York City to help that. The second thing we need to do is be able to figure out how we um, make it easier to live in New York City in a time of rising costs and with all these other debt burdens. So uh, my core proposal is universal childcare, right? Eight to 6 p.m., 12 months a year, um, within a 15 minute walk ideally of every family. And I think this is a way that we're also going to be able to ensure that women can continue their careers and have career advancement going forward. And then I, I think the final thing is that in addition to looking at how we reduce costs, we also need to figure out how we have growth. And technology is going to be an, an, an amazing way to do this. We know that small business before COVID represented over half of the workforce in New York City. And over the prior 10 years, small business represented 100% of the job growth. And so in those cases, what, what the city's obligation is to you is to be able to enable you to grow your careers as quickly as possible, to be able to find opportunities to pursue entrepreneurship or innovation to figure out how we actually use the convening power of City Hall and the mayor's office to bring the communities together, both within the government, but also within to the private sector and bridge that so that you can see the most opportunities attain mentorship and, and growth in, in, in your careers. Okay, great. All right. Well, my thanks to the to the panelists. Really, really super, super question. So, all right. I guess it's finally my, my turn. I'm excited to, get to, <laughs> to chat with you a bit. Um, I wanted to start off with a question that I think sometimes doesn't get asked that much of mayoral candidates. You know, which is, you know, New York City is a is a massive organization, and, and when we're electing a mayor, we're electing someone to run that organization and to manage it. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of 
your approach, I guess, to, to management and how that would inform, you know, um, your running of the city. And then also as a secondary point, talk a little bit about how you might draw upon your tech background in, 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 in relation to, to your management. Great. Um, well, just to kind of put a really sharp point on the size of the city government, um, the GDP of the New York City region, greater New York City metro area is, would make it the, in the top 20 of all countries if we were a country. If you look at the budget, the budget of the city is larger than all but four states. The size of the city government, if it were a corporation, would put it in the top 30 of all US-based corporations. So this is an incredibly important and vital job. And what this process does is it's electing people, but it's actually a hiring process. So Michael, I really appreciate that question because it, it doesn't really get asked at all. And so when I look at, at management and there's, this, there's been this kind of growing philosophy in the tech industry going all the way back into the early 2000s that the model of technology, the architecture of technology is actually mirrored in the architecture of your management structure and organizations. That as we think about technology as being flatter, um, with just very few layers that we also think then about management structure as being flatter. So when you look at companies like Google or Amazon, you know, the, the number of layers that they have from the top down to the bottom is significantly less than is typical in government or in traditional industry. And what that allows is it means that the, the, the person at the top has a much closer view and, and touch for what's happening you know, in the interface between frontline workers or the technology and their end consumers. Um, and so we need to do that in this city, right? The mayor's obligation going forward, and I think millennials will especially will, 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 will resonate with this, is that the mayor needs to feel like, uh, the mayor needs to convey the, not just the impression, but also the actuality, the realization that every person in New York City has the potential to be able to communicate with potentially the mayor, but definitely with city halls, a two-way communication, right? In, in the channels that you want, in the languages that you prefer, right? If you're disabled in the, in, in the way that you need to be able to consume that information. So this two-way interaction, like we don't have that in government right now. We don't have this customer orientation in government services whatsoever. So what this means is that we have to depart completely away from the de Blasio style of management, which is to put everything into silos and silos within silos, because that, re that creates redundancies, duplicative efforts, duplicative processes from agency to agency, duplicative teams. It also means that you have to have much, much bigger overhead in the city, which translates into budget. So you have to look at the $98.6 billion proposed budget and you have to ask yourselves, why is it $23 billion more than it was just eight years ago? And that's $23 billion in real dollars. We need to do, we need to, so we need to not, we need to stop looking at problems as fragmented in individual silos and where the opportunities are, are where the problems intersect. And it's those intersections that really give us the most interesting ability to find a solution that can address many, many different aspects at the same time. And technology is gonna be core to that because you can't deliver in today's environment without actually thinking about technology and how it's going to be part of that process. Okay, great, um, thank you for that. So veering course to a, a different subject, um, again, one that I don't feel gets raised that much, maybe I've missed it, but. You know, I think a huge issue the new mayor will be dealing with is this question of students who've been outside of school, uh, some for, for as long as a year, if not more. Um, for, by my understanding, in some respects, we sort of never have dealt with that, right? This sort of question of you have students who weren't able to be in classrooms, uh, to see their teachers, to see their fellow students. Um, so I just think it's a really huge issue that will be on this, this new mayor's uh, plate um, you know, in January of the coming year. What would be your 
uh, approach to this question are um, helping those students who were out and getting reintegrated back into school. And just because it's the topic of the day, in what way do you think technology might come into play to, to, to wrestling with that issue? Great. So I'll, I'm gonna lay out very simply. I think the question is, is our expectation that students have to be, have to catch up to conform to the system or should the system adapt to the students? And I would lay out the following numbers. We knew before COVID that 30% of the system have a learning difference, right? They have an IEP. We also know that about 10% of our students experience homelessness at one point or another. We also know that another 10% of our students are English as a second language learners, which is also a type of learning difference. And now you have COVID and so many students unable to, to really, this idea of catching up or keeping up, I'm not sure how you measure that, and then we've, we've had the system where 65% of black children, you know, are educated so they don't meet grade level education. And so we have a system which is fundamentally broken from anything. I would argue that the vast of students already come in with what constitutes a learning difference. And so as a result, we need technology is key. My oldest son has, has a learning difference. And he had the privilege of going to some best specialized high best specialized middle schools in, in the city. And every student had an individualized learning program that was meaningful. Didn't say that you were slow, you know, it said that you were different. Some students are better at some things than other things. And I think we all are, right? None of us are equally good at everything. So why doesn't the system actually address that? Why doesn't the system actually take students who have high potential in very specific areas and give them high potential educations? And for, for students who are, who, are, who are lagging in other areas, you know, why don't we address it by putting them in, in context of other students who are also doing the same thing? In a system of over immunities, right, the scale gives us lots of opportunities and in is problem and technology is this is, is the layer that's going to allow a manage that scale and provide individualized it to these you know to each student and meet them where they are okay i know we're, we're ending soon but i think i have time for one more question so i, I did want to ask you uh this one this one's been fresh in mind for me and i think a lot of people i speak to as well um, what do you think the city's role should be uh, in, uh, some people call it the COVID passport, uh, you know, the vaccination passport idea, you use whatever term you want, but the sort of the, this question now of maybe uh, people being able to establish that they, that they have gotten, that they are vaccinated and how that might implicate places they can go or not go, a um, lot, lot of there and a lot to get through in 90 seconds or whatever, but what, what do you think about that, that issue? I am a kind of uh, immunization of a, va of a COVID vaccine passport. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, but what we see in like the governor's Excelsior, right, that the issues aren't really thought through. Like there is no framework about thinking about privacy and security, about geolocation, about the of exposing your data and where you are to other people who might actually want to do harm to you. And I think particularly about women who have stalkers or people who are in domestic violence relationships, this is, this is a terrible, terrible uh, abuse or potential abuse um, to other things. Right? We think about also vaccinations, immunization records for, for children. You know, if you have ever been a you have to go through and for you know, over and over and over and over again, you should be able to solve problems. I hope I didn't cut out there. Sorry about that.
No, no, no. Thanks. Thanks uh, very, very much. Uh, Dean, shall I turn it over to you? Yeah, I just want to thank uh, Art Chang for joining us today. This has been a robust and wide ranging discussion all uh, against the backdrop of technology. And we certainly heard a lot of uh, your experience, Art, um, both as a tech entrepreneur and how you would look at public policy and technology to advance so many challenging situations the city is confronting, both longstanding challenges and ones that have emerged certainly over the past uh, 15 months. So we thank you for your perspective. And I wanna thank Professor Pastor for his uh, leading us through this conversation and also our wonderful uh, students and alumna. Um, it gives a really great perspective on what is on the minds of uh, today's young voters. And we are greatly appreciative of, uh, of the work they did in preparing for today. So with that, I thank you all for joining us and uh, Art, good luck and thank you uh, again. Um, and uh, we will see you again uh, for another program uh, to be announced. Thanks so much, bye-bye.